and former head from Department of History, SNLT Women's University, Mumbai. And she has also worked as head Department of History, Ramnarayan Ruya College, Mumbai. She was appointed. She was appointed by Government of India on the Histo Indian Historical Records Committee, New Delhi, for five years. She was appointed by MHRD as nominee of President of India. She was appointed by MHRD as nominee of President of India on two central universities in India, that is University of Karnataka, Kalburgi, as a member of Executive Council and the Central University of Tamil Nadu, Tiruvalli. She was one of the two national advisory members of UGC New Delhi for special assistance program, department research support schemes of two universities in India, Kakatiya University, Varangal, Telangana, and MS University, Baroda. She is on the managing committee of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai. She was city historian consultant on the Heritage Review Committee, Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai. She has been the convener of skill sectors, culture, AICT, MHRD, New Delhi. She has published almost eight books and 63 research articles, completed four research projects, of which one was granted by the Royal Numismatic Society, the British Museum, London, and another by Mumbai Metropolitan Region Heritage Conservation Society, Mumbai. With such an enriching academic career, she has truly carried the legacy of her father and scholar, Professor S. A. Dangi. I heartily welcome you, Madam. I welcome Professor Sindhu Dange, Madam, who is present here. I welcome all professors, senior professors, academicians, scholars, and students present for this program. And uh, now I request Professor Varsha Shirgaukar, Madam, to start with her lecture on situating mythical narratives in socio-cultural history. Thank you. Thank you. First and foremost, I am really feeling overwhelmed that the Sanskrit department has given me opportunity uh, to speak in the lecture series program which is uh, in the honor of my late father, Professor Sadashiv Edange. Though he is not amongst us, uh, he has left his spirit behind, I would say, uh, in the form of my mother and the three daughters, his three daughters. So first and foremost, I bow down to my mother, Professor Sindhu Dange before I start this lecture. Now, uh, in this uh, presentation, I will be uh, sometimes uh, using the name as Dr. Sadashiv A. Dange or sometimes as my father. And of course, before I uh, start my presentation, I want to personally thank Dr. Shakuntala Gaude for uh, uh, giving such a brilliant introduction of mine. Actually, I am a daughter of Sanskrit department. Similarly, Madhavi Narsale, Suchitra Tajne, I am the newcomer, though I haven't uh, met him any time, but I have heard about him, uh, Mr. Pense. Uh, we are actually as a family. So uh, this honor uh, given to me is like I am coming back again uh, to my Maher. I can say. Uh, so we will uh, begin this. Actually, uh, this particular attempt on my part is uh, to connect what uh, Dr. Sadashi Dange has left behind because in history also, we are undertaking some of the myths. We are trying to dissect the myths, trying to find out whether there is any historical fact in it. Though, there are some historians who are outrightly rejecting myths. So which particular branch of interpreting history is considering myths that will be revealed a little bit from my presentation. So here we go. Um.
Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, madam. Yes, yes? Madam. Okay, okay. Uh, so the title, as has been uh, stated here, is Situating Mythical Narratives in Sociocultural History. Now, I am uh, more concerned about cultural history here because that is my forte. I have been dealing with cultural historiography uh, since uh, many years. In fact, uh, to be uh, precise, from 20 years, last 20 years as such. Though political history also has some myths, we will be not taking them because otherwise this will be a very, uh, you know, uh, big lecture and it will go off uh, the time limit. Uh, first and foremost, we have to understand uh, why Herodotus is called the father of history. Herodotus, whose period is the Greek historian, of course, uh, is 484 to 430 BCE. That is before Christian era. Um, actually, when he started collecting many lolographs, this particular word lolograph, L-O-L-O-G-R-A-P-H, lolograph, this is uh, indicative of the bardic poetry. Many ballads were composed earlier. As we also have the ballad uh, tradition that is a Shahiri Parampara in our culture, Similarly, in Greco-Roman civilization also, practically in every civilization, there have been uh, many compositions, which were the oral comp compositions, and these compositions were passed on from generation to generation. But there was no chronology. Now, history is a subject which is definitely based on chronology. We have to go by the concept of linear history. In Hinduism, we have got the cyclical patterns also of the yugas. And after the last yuga, again we come to the first yuga. So it is called a kind of chakra. But in Greco-Roman civilization or in the Greek interpretation of history, it is called the linear history. Now, Herodotus did a commendable work by separation of the mythical and legendary narratives from historical facts. And as I said earlier, he put these historical facts, he events rather, in chronological order. Now, later, when an assessment of Herodotus' work was to be undertaken, another historiographer who is a well known historiographer as per our own, uh, say, philosophy of history, R.G. Collingwood, he made an assessment of Herodotus saying that I would call him the first historiographer, and that's why the father of history, because he put some standards in history writing. Collingwood also believed in these standards, and Herodotus' work tallied with these standards of Collingwood. So here we have history is actually a science. Of course, it is a social science. Then history has to be humanistic, human beings oriented. Earlier ballads that were composed, they hardly separated the divine beings orders from the human beings actions, which Herodotus actually did. And that is why history, Collingwood says, has to be humanistic, which Herodotus is proved. Then history has inquiry procedure. We should ask why, what happened, in which year. Then every human endeavor in history is with a purpose. There has to be a purpose. So history, in other words, is a cause and effect relationship. What we see or uh, as the event that is actually the consequence of some cause. And historians would go to the cause and then analyze as to how this cause turned into effect. That was the last point. Now, without going into the details of these, which 
uh, we uh, actually deal with in history class, we come to another particular work of medieval times. See, in medieval times, many Arab historiographers have also done very important work. And these works were in Arabic. Some of them are translated. So I will uh, cite here the example of one Arab historiographer. And by the way, when I say historiography, historiography is a science of writing of history. We have got various angles in history writing. So we call it historiography. So Ibn Khaldun, who was an Arab historiographer, his famous work is Mukaddima. And in Mukaddima, the first uh, large part, uh, fortunately, is translated into English and that is available online also. But it's a big work, about 1400 pages. And in that, he says that there definitely is uh, the need for separation of mythical narratives from the historical facts. Because the mythical narratives in history, they are so embedded with each other, it is very difficult to separate at times. What is the real fact actually? And uh, whether the event had taken place in what way it took place, uh, it is very difficult to know. So uh, he gives them very interesting example. Uh, he cites the uh, example of another Arab historiographer, Al Masudi. Now he says that Al Masudi, his mythical narrative is about Alexander when he wanted to have Alexandrias. See, we all know Alexander the Great. In uh, Hindi, we say Sikandar. Now uh, he was a Macedonian king. Macedonia was a part of Greece. So he came on, okay, he uh, came to India and we know that he also conquered India. Now, on um, whenever Alexander was going back, when he was going back on the way, he wanted to create the Alexandrias. On um, Uh, you see, you have made me co-host, but am I supposed to also enter the people here because I'm getting a phone call of somebody here, Mrs. Pense. Hello? Hello? Uh, hello, madam. Ha, you have made me co-host, so am I supposed to enter the people also? No, no, that will be taken care of other co-hosts. You ah, are made co-host because uh, you will be able to speak, ah. otherwise all are on mute. Okay, okay. Because see, I am uh, actually getting one phone call, three missed calls by uh, Dr. Pense, Dr. Zamkhedkar's sister. I don't know for what, but I had uh, given her the link also. Yes, yes. They will get admitted. Don't worry. Ah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is it possible to enter her? I, I don't know the procedure now. No, no, they will get admitted. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. So I'll continue with that. So I was just saying that when Alexander came so far away by going back, he ensured that the cities would be created on his name. That is Alexandria. But interestingly, when he was coming to uh, the Arabian Ocean, so in some parts of Arabian Ocean, he could see that his ships were coming down. They were getting destroyed. Now, uh, definitely there must have been some kind of geographical or climatic uh, condition there. But it is very interesting that Al Masudi, <coughs> he connected this to interpret in a very mythical manner. And he said there were some sea monsters. And these sea monsters were not allowing Alexander to build Alexandria. So coming back again to Ibn Khaldun, we say that Ibn Khaldun was interested that we should not go by any mythical interpretations. Now we come to the next. <coughs> 
sorry. And now having said that there were some historiographers who were against the myths, we will find interestingly that from 1930s onwards, in fact, from 1929 only, we have got a very, very important place given to myths in annals historiography. Now this annals historiography, that is annals way of writing history, annals, uh, as many of you know, means the records. Now, there were certain French young historians, Marc Bloch and Lucie Faber, interestingly, See, some of you are mythology students also, or you teach mythology, and you are teaching structuralism of Lévi-Strauss, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Interestingly, Mark Bloch, and especially Mark Bloch, was very much influenced by the contemporary uh, social uh, thinkers, I'm saying social thinkers, even anthropologists and all, like uh, Bronislaw Malinowski and uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. So you will find that when Mark Bloch gave his own idea of uh, interpreting history, he said for cultural history, we have to undertake myths because myths may have a shadow of history, which I think Dr. Sadashiv Dange also has made a point in his book towards understanding uh, Hindu myths. Interestingly, on page number 153, I think he has mentioned Annals School uh, in uh, the context of Claude Lévi-Strauss when I was going through that particular book. So both these uh, historians, Mark Bloch and Lucy Faber, they uh, gave birth to a particular historiography, Annals historiography, which is cultural historiography. And uh, for cultural historiography, the resources would be not the documents, because the documents, the published documents, were mostly government records and all, which were giving more, uh, say, uh, approach of the political or administrative history. But for cultural history, we must collect the sources like oral narratives, customs, manners, rituals, like even, uh, you see, going to various places, attending the weddings of the tribal communities, different communities as such. So you will find that uh, when Mark Bloch wrote his first book, Historian's Craft, it was very interesting. And uh, he has said as to how the historian must have his craft, craft work done. And in that, you will find different kinds of jargons of uh, arriving at historical conclusions like credibility, authenticity, etc. These are all discussed here. We should not go into the details of that. Then later you will find that this same kind of thread was taken up by the conferences at Southampton and New York in 1973-2005 respectively. And in these conferences, we will find there was consideration of myths as legitimate forms of discourse because it was said that myths may provide important clues, especially for cultural history. In the later slides, we are going to see some examples which you will find very interesting as to how the myths can uh, give you some ideas, some clues. So like they are also the shadows of history. Now we come to uh, a particular uh, type of myths here. We will be selecting only some myths which are connected with history. And I mean, I'm sure that uh, honestly, Sanskrit department has opened a new vista for me because earlier I used to just uh, think to myself as to how uh, the cultural historiographers of Annals School, is it that I can do something more for that? And it so happened that when the lockdown started, there was nothing else to do, but I had already downloaded the big volumes of Fernand Brodel, who is the third uh, analyst historian after Mark Bloch and Lucy Faber about whose uh, mention we have done in the first slide. So I used to read them. 
you see after doing household work i used to read them and then uh, there is one particular chapter daily bread that really interested me uh, that discussion will be coming uh, we will be coming to it in the next slide also and then i thought oh come on now that sanskrit department has given me opportunity i will utilize some of the sources which i have found in that particular cultural historiographers book also original book so we will find that there are myths related to the staple crops in hindu civilization practically in every civilization there are myths connected with the staple crops even uh, you see for vasubaras just diwali is over this month only and we know that there is a particular myth con uh, connected with the fresh crops of wheat as to how that particular daughter in law by mistake kills the two calves okay because her mother in law had said lawali gawali she is on thev so among maharashtrians this particular myth is very popular okay so that is connected with the first fresh crops which are ready just before diwali time as such that apart now i am going to take you to andes mountain latin america it is very interesting to note that even though there were earlier civilizations like inca maya aztec the world didn't know about them till the spaniards or the spanish had their colonial expeditions they came here of course in search of gold and the other uh, mineral sources but then we will see as to how cultural historiographers can connect these myths with the crops so knowledge about maize potato cocoa beans and quinoa you must be knowing that today for the health uh, conscious people quinoa also is said to be very important there are quinoa breads also there is a misconception that we saw potato through the portuguese but actually the portuguese have seen the potato through the spanish and the spanish saw the potato for the first time in peru the land peru i'm saying so you will find that these were the main crops of latin america and of the indians of america indians here as in red indians before you have the formation of united states of america so uh, important staple crop was the maize and it was grown also on the terraces of the andes mountainous ranges including peru now here you will find that this entire range is andes it is said that there are about five mountainous ranges globally which are very important and andes mountainous range is one of them interestingly there are these goddesses the peruvian maize goddess that is the mother main mother goddess is sara mama uh we have this reference from jg fraser's golden bow page number 413 and other goddesses are potato mother exo mama coco mother coco mama and quinoa mother that is quinoa mama these you find in jg fraser's book now we will see what is the cultural historiographer of anal school that is fun and brodel is saying as i told you these volumes attracted my attention during lockdown and it became a habit for me to read for 2 to 3 3 hours in the afternoon fun and brodel has written a book voluminous book civilization and capitalism 15th and 18th century and volume 1 is structures of everyday life and in that there is a chapter on daily bread 
in which he analyzes the food three kinds of foods he says were current in medieval india also wheat rice and maize apart from that there is absolutely no other staple food he says and then of course by and by there are sub staple foods also like potato and all so uh, he says fanand rodel says that inca maya and aztec civilizations and other semi civilizations also had the staple food maize and this continued to be the pattern till 17th 18th century and interestingly there are archaeological findings around mexico city they are found uh, there are a uh, fossilized columns if not the ears of maize and some of them of this uh, of the maize types are cultivated presently even today he says in the 20th century as well and other places of ancient maize cultivation were paraguay peru and guatemala apart from these civilizations so definitely these civilizations brought in for the first time the uh, cultivation of maize now here i am giving you one very interesting uh, picture from the same book and this is an indian maize plantation the indian camp i am saying again remember this indian is red indian is to be understood as red indian the indian camp of sekota in virginia which is today in usa and this is actually a plate in the sense of a kind of a sketch and this picture this photograph is reproduced from the sketch you will see that there are ritual dances also and he is describing on the pages here on page number 162 163 that these are the maize cultivations arranged and then in between whatever is the passage there are the dances ritual dances of the red indians after the maize production is undertaken we can very well compare uh, these things with our festivals like navratri when we have got the fresh kind of produce uh, so my point is that actually in medieval times when the spanish occupied this place for the first time in 16th century and found that these place these people they were not really civilized unfortunately you will find that there was in masse a conversion into christianity of these people and naturally their goddesses they became the christian mothers this kind of reference we have uh, later but unfortunately fernand brodel has not connected them to the mother goddesses and all that which fraser has pointed out so possibly for a historian i mean i may develop this later who knows that we have to understand what have been the colonial records and is it that the colonial records are just barely given ruthlessly without having any kind of uh, thought about the culture of the colonized people uh, that, that is how we say in history so you will find he says that on page 162 163 and all that he says that when the spaniards came there they found that these people were just eating maize potato and that also the spanish found the value of potato when some spanish people some local people there they told if you take the dried potato with you on the ships you can survive on the ships and then later on they found the value of potato and potato became actually the most popular one can say the root in the entire world today as such and then brodel writes that they had the habit of chewing coco leaves interestingly please remember for the first time the drinking chocolate and all that was a kind of novel innovation of the spanish people we are going to see it later now you see here they could find a particular page of a manuscript and uh, they saw 
the potato goddess that is exomama being planted so incas planting and harvesting potatoes their tools are digging sticks and hoes and this is a peruvian codex codex is a manuscript of 16th century now i, I have brought in again this picture from the same book of brodel but when he he is discussing about the drinks after the daily bread he comes to the drinks he goes even to the details smaller details like when the spoons came to be utilized for the first time how the tables were arranged dining tables were arranged how the curtains were laid you know all basic things and that is meant to be actually the cultural historiography and here i am uh, showing you drinking chocolate in spain a painting in besancon museum france in france one artist had painted these are the silver vessels when the spanish understood the knack of extracting juice from the cocoa leaves after they occupied peru then they were really very thrilled with the kind of taste if you add sugar to it and with the kind of you know a spirited a sense which one gets after having the cocoa and then you have got the entire growth of chocolate industry and all that see how the myths could be connected this is what i wanted to show you and this is i i find this very interesting kind of uh, you know manuscript page because here you will find some andes mountainous ranges are seen the sun is shining that means they must be doing this in the hot sun i mean this kind of plantation and they are taking lot of pains but at the same time there are smiling expressions on their faces because potato must have been very dear to their heart all right now after the andes we come to this particular a myth and this is a case of kham baba you see in on uh, say 2002 or so there was indian history congress at bhopal that time i was head of the department of history at ruya college so we decided to go for that not only that i i used to go for the sessions but this time we decided to even take some of the interested research students with us so we were a group of about 8 to 10 and uh, we decided that we will be also doing the site scene and uh, we stayed there one day extra which was permissible we were very much interested in seeing the pillar of heliodorus and we hired a a uh, big uh, vehicle the driver didn't understand what is heliodorus and then we started looking at on uh, some information tourist information because emails and all that they were not so rampant at that time i'm talking about say 20 years back or so and then we found interesting reference of kham baba then the driver said oh yes yes i can take you to khamba uh, by that time see these sessions are in december evening was setting we reached there around 5 and it was not uh, really visible clearly visible but we could see it we could see it. and then there were some villagers <coughs> sitting there so we asked them what is this pillar name they said it is kham baba and uh, they pointed out at this this particular pillar and uh, then one of them who was uh, quite vocal talkative little bit uh, he started saying that aap ye ped dekh rahe hain piche to ye ped ko kuch baal lagaye hue hain you know some hair bunch of hairs 2 2 3 3 like that and they were nailed so uh, we asked him what is the you know purpose of this so he said uh, 
जो औरतों को कुछ न कुछ बीमारी होती है ना औरत वाली बीमारी तो वो यहाँ आते हैं पूनम राशि के दिन और ये जो खाम बाबा है तो उसके साथ इधर का जो एक है वो बात बातचीत करता है मतलब यू नो भगत काइंड ऑफ पर्सन द प्रीस्ट लोकल प्रीस्ट एंड देन दैट भगत प्लक्स वन और टू हेयर ही पुल्स ही पुल्स वन और टू हेयर एंड देन अटैचेस देन टू द ट्री of every woman who goes there for some kind of counseling now it is so interesting that a greek indo greek ambassador heliodorus became a kham baba now kham baba narrative now we have to understand how heliodorus killer must have become a kham baba so i am just naming it process of making kham baba speak you see it so happened that this pillar came to notice in 1877 under alexander cunningham the director of archaeological survey of india you see he <clears throat> he being the director of archaeological survey of india was given the task of documenting the scattered objects in uh, north india bihar uttar pradesh mainly and then you will find that by and by his team members must have come here and they observed this particular pillar which was having some characteristics of maybe gupta a time pillar that was just a, a premise preliminary observation so it was ascribed initially to imperial gupta period that is from 300 ce to 550 ce on the basis of the shape of the pillar and the garuda mount reading of the inscription in brahmi but for some time you will find see in 1877 and after that within 2 3 years <clears throat> this pillar got documented but then it became like that only it was just kept like that because there was it was smeared with lot of kumkum because as i said the villagers were worshiping it as khamba baun so every time a woman with gynecological problem came there she would worship him by applying sindoor as if he is the great lord naturally there were layers and layers of kumkum vermilion in 1901 another search a fresh search was undertaken of these scattered objects and mr lake one archaeologist in the team he scrubbed that vermilion and could read brahmi for the first time on that then later marshall whose name is associated with indus valley civilization also so you will find that details were given by uh, john marshall with lake in the journal of the royal asiatic society in 1909 and then they understood that pillar very well and then the antiquity of that the pillar dated around 113 bce and it belonged to the shunga period and uh, see even uh, the sanskrit people know that shunga phase came after the mauryas you see shunga was a kind of reaction that is they wanted to re establish brahmanical religion because they found that ashoka maurya had posed a great danger to brahmanical religion by the rampant spread of buddhism naturally you will find that in shunga period even some of the foreigners were accepted as into bhagavat dharma fifth shunga king kausit putra bhagavadra in his 14th regnal year 
it is said he welcomed heliodorus who was a greek ambassador of the indo greek king antial sidas and interestingly in this inscription heliodorus is named as a bhagavata now we have to understand sorry we have to understand as to how kham baba i mean heliodorus pillar must have become kham baba you see for some time that is till the shunga period maybe even till gupta period was over the identity of heliodorus might have continued with the you know characteristics like the garuda and all that but later it is quite possible that people gradually forgot but one thing remained prominently in their memory that was he was somebody different he in the sense heliodorus the one who constructed this pillar was somebody different than our culture the name was forgotten but something important ritualistic important uh, object this kind of memory might have existed and this memory actually was perpetuated but then as the name was absent he became the kham kham baba when actually now again we have to construct it from the point of view of uh, emergence of medieval languages as well so you will find that in hindustani and all and uh, medieval languages early medieval languages we say gradually they emerged from 8th century ce so naturally the word kham in hindi and the word baba some baba foreign baba foreign ka baba but that that was forgotten so interestingly this is what i want to say here that many times you will find the archaeologists have also to understand the mythical narratives because through the mythical narratives only they find something really very valuable this is just one example i am sure there are so many examples and we need to construct them from the point of view of history and uh, now i am coming to another very interesting uh, mythical narrative which uh, i mean i am developing i have little bit developed somewhat and i want to give here a kind of personal information because i think this personal information i can definitely share on this platform um see when i was invited as nominee of president of india that is visitors nominee in the central university of tamil nadu for the first time i went there in august 2019 and uh this particular university central university of tamil nadu is at tiruvarur which is very much inside naturally i looked at the website i could see that it is built on a one off shoot of kaveri river and um, the website also said that uh, here was also the seat uh, of administration of the cholas as such now naturally for me it was a very very new terrain going there also was not very simple from here taking flight to chennai then at chennai some stop over then from chennai another flight to tiruchirappalli that is trichanapalli and that also like a charter plane okay the small plane with two uh, two two seats only and then from there about uh, 150 kilometers by car university of course used to send me uh, the car so when i for the first time sat in the car the driver uh, was trying to explain to me 
in somewhat english manner and uh, he could uh, tell me in broken english only that he can't speak hindi so but then uh, he started you know giving me some information of the roads and the territories and i was really overwhelmed because my father seemingly had started his work he was there merely for 8 years in that territory so i immediately phoned my mother and then i said maybe i'm traveling in the same area where he must have traveled and there were honestly i'm tell you there were tears in my eyes when he was telling me madam this this road goes to kumbakonam this this will uh, take us here this will take us to tanjore from tanjore then about 35 to 40 kilometers is that university and all that so i was uh, it was just like you know uh, the divine giving me the opportunity to travel in that area where my father must have traveled actually and there also another extremely important coincidence i want to tell you see there was one lady expert from english department who came from pondicherry professor sujata uh, she took us to tyagraj temple uh, because she knew that territory that tiruvarur and all that way. in the evening we used to have time because once uh, when i used to go to that uh, particular uh, university i would be stuck up there for seven days because the work was such so i used to meet different people actually so uh, she took us to tyagraj temple and then while coming back she said uh, tomorrow i am going to one of the oldest uh, uh, chola temples which is uh, little away about say 25 kilometers from the university so i just jumped on the idea and i said yeah, yeah come on i mean i will uh, get up in morning and then i'll get ready and come with you then i met yama for the first time it was actually the shiva temple but the first shrine that you worship is the yama shrine i did that visit she gave me some kind of oral information about that that will come eventually later when i come to that particular temple but then the first thing that i did after coming home was that i started looking through the books of dr sadashiv dange divine hymns and ancient thought then of course encyclopedia of puranic beliefs and practices to find out what are the myths of yama and then i could say i could see that yama has been given the god like stature during rigvedic times yama is portrayed as drinking soma in the company of gods under a tree so his god like stature is accepted according to vedic myths then dr arend dandekar's book vedic mythological tracts there also i could find the reference that he is the symbol of god and man he is the first mortal and being the first mortal he takes care that all the departed souls are taken safely to the next world there is mention of yama in the 10th book of rigveda now dr sadashiv dange gives the description of yama in garuda purana and brahma purana periods of the puranas approximately are 3rd uh, century ce to 10th century ce now portrayal of yama usually is black complexion he has red eyes he is difficult to look at and he is mounted on a he buffalo and of course very important he has a nook and iron staff in hand and his two sons are the two dogs named shama and shabal uh interestingly the shrine which i saw and also another particular shrine which i visited in my next visit is having the same iconic iconographic representation so along with these you see mythical descriptions which are there in rigveda in puranas and all that the sculptors 
made the iconography as they made iconography of uh, say uh, lord vishnu shiva and all they made also of yama and interestingly tamil nadu has many yama myths and the yama worship there is considered to be very important the references that i quoted in the previous slides they all say that yama's direction is the southern direction and this is considered to be southern direction is considered to be the abode of yama since ancient times we have given a uh, honor to yama's personality in our diwali rites also and our yama dvitiya also is celebrated as bhayaduja bhaubis and all that but at the same time there is a very very strong association which you find in tamil nadu temples shiva temples especially wherever yama is there uh, that is the yama's association of yama with lord shiva uh, see both lord shiva and yama they are associated with the work of destruction on um, after reading dr sukumari bhattacharya's book i could see she says that in 10th mandala of rugveda this particular destruction aspect of yama is very very clear since lord shiva later on came to be accepted in brahmanical mode yama and shiva both were considered to be having the same duties as such in tamil nadu there are all together nine yama temples uh, inclusive of shrines also all together nine either shrines or temples and very importantly tiruvarur the place which i i have been visiting as nominee of president of india is resorted to as a place to die by many aged and pious brahmins it is said that anybody who comes to tiruvarur uh, has a peaceful death i don't know what will be my that particular hour it is for the youngsters to judge i am giving you that particular duty from now only anyway just jokes apart um in tiruvarur the most important is the tagraj shiva temple i could visit that and see the grandeur and uh, gazetteer of madras district tanjore uh, actually madras district gazetteer uh, tanjore district which is published in 1906 that gives a myth of a boy killed by yamana that is the gazetteer says associated with tyagraj ting but actually that area entire area from tiruvarur to another small place called tirukadavur which is about 38 kilometers away from tiruvarur that entire area has the circulation of yama myth actually the particular incident which has been recorded by the gazetteer to her, which uh, gazetteer says has taken place in tagraj temple it was not in tagraj temple actually but it is said to be at tirukadavur what is the myth about that this is a myth of markandeya he was a son of mrukandu and marudmati this story comes in markandeya purana they were both husband and wife worshippers of lord shiva they were not getting a child after lot of uh, say worship of lord shiva lord shiva said you have a choice either you will get a son who is having lot many diseases and all that and he will continue to exist remain for many years alive 
or you will get a son who will be very intelligent very good looking but he will die in youth naturally the couple opted for the second type of son and with utmost belief in the worship of lord shiva markandeya the son along with his parents believed that he will be saved now as per shiva's prophecy yama sent his dutas to take his pran markandeya's pran but markandeya was sitting in the temple of lord shiva as the story goes this is sala purana and uh, one dr chelan m chelan he has written a small book on these nine temples on uh, of yama temples and shrines in tamil nadu it's a small one though and it is in tamil but uh, i remember i got this book in my second visit uh, through uh, dr vivekananda gopal of tanjore and uh, there was a young uh, person who was working as a guest house attendant there in the university central university of tamil nadu but actually he wanted to give his upsc very clever boy so i told him every evening when i come back from your office will you please read out some things and then i said you will be reading this out to me for giving knowledge and hence you will be paid you will be remunerated he he was not really accepting but i said no this is academic work and through him i could uh, you know uh, have the gist of some pages uh, of this particular tamil book now this is the myth of markandeya the beautiful description he was like a jasmine flower so fresh but yama's dutas came to take his prana but he clasped the shiva linga so tightly that they couldn't you see take his prana because otherwise that would disturb the shiva linga they reported back to yama so yama came himself and yama had his nook so tightly that the shiva linga came out and there came lord shiva very angry as to why he was taking the prana of his devotee and then at that time you will find that yama was killed but he was both were restored as the story goes markandeya also and then you will find this particular place tirukadavur is associated with this particular story of markandeya but as i said the yama myth is so uh, you know popular there within the area of 40 50 kilometers also that that main temple of shiva tyagaraj temple at tiruvarur also is supposed to be having that myth as has been reported by the madras state gazette so you will find that the historical reporting also has some flaws maybe because uh the british officers who were reporting did not really know and the british officer who is reporting he says yaman instead of yama <clears throat> uh as i said earlier tiruvarur is the main settlement of the cholas and um we will find that the cholas were worshippers of lord shiva in fact cholas and pallavas these two dynasties their first phase is shrouded in mystery we know only from the literary accounts that is from sangam literature but inscriptions are available from their second phase but there are some hymnists that is the uh, com uh, composers hymn composers who actually by tradition say that they have taken some threads from the sangam literature and through uh, their compositions it is quite possible to reconstruct uh, this fact that uh, in uh, tamil nadu the cholas were having the shiva worship 
also from the first phase. And uh, when they came to the second phase, interestingly, you will find that all those who were Shiva's attendees, they also came to be worshipped. And hence, initially, if this particular Markandeya myth was Shiva Markandeya myth, it came to be associated also with Yama myth. So we have got Shiva Markandeya Yama myth. Now we come to another particular temple. As I said, in August 2019, when I saw this shrine for the first time, the shrine will come later, actually. Uh, but Tiruvarur the, was the place which I was often visiting. And that's why I had to bring that slide beforehand. I had decided to my mind that I will be uh, trying to see as many uh, Yama temples as possible. Of course, I could... Uh, only see two shrines and temple together and one reference which I have given earlier of Markandeya. Now, uh, we went from Tanjore in search of this particular temple which is at Tiruchitrambalam. Now, Tiruchitrambalam is about 70 kilometers, I think from, uh, not 70, but about yeah, for 50 or so from Tanjore. And uh, by and by, we came first to a Shiva temple and around 500 meters from the main Shiva temple, there is this particular temple, which is called Yama Dharmaraj temple. Now top of the temple and the icon inside, as you will find the iconography exactly matches with um, whatever is a description in the Puranas. That is Yama. He has the piercing eyes, as you can see from here. Even on the top, also, Yama is shown on the he buffalo inside. Also, this is the particular shrine uh, and the icon as such. And you will find these two dogs also. And as you have got the Nandi for Shiva temple, here you have got this he buffalo. That is, as you can see, he buffalo is watching. This, this particular is here. All right. So he is looking at his master. Uh, now, here you will find it is said, see, according to me, of course, one has to uh, look into that again, actually. Uh, this must have been earlier a shrine, not an independent temple, but today it appears to be a temple. Pond is the common place between the Shiva temple, which is nearby about 500 meters, and then this, this particular. So it could have been a huge temple complex earlier, of which this also must have been a shrine. But the Pujari, who met us. Of course, he was speaking in Tamil, but I had two people uh, say uh, uh, Dr. Vivekanand Gopal had given me one escort and he was also speaking in Tamil to him so I could understand what he was saying. So he says that the oral narrative goes that here Manmat was killed. Manmat, that is Kamdev. And we all know the story goes like this, that Shiva was extremely <clears throat> sad that uh, Parvati had to enter the fire. So he was all alone and he lost interest in any kind of samsar, as you can interpret. But the gods were really worried because they said, if a child of Shankar and Parvati, Shiva and Parvati, doesn't come forward, then the demon cannot be killed. So anyhow, Lord Shiva should be made to believe in uh, this worldly life. And so you will find that they sent Parvati in the garb of a beautiful girl. And there was in the corner Manmatha or Madana with his love arrows to disturb the penance of Lord Shiva. For a second, 
Lord Shiva's penance got disturbed. He looked at Parvati and he had the love feeling. But immediately he got the balance and he understood that this was a kind of somebody's magic. And before the gods could appeal to him, he opened his third eye and burned Manmat there and there itself. So Rati came crying and then <clears throat> with God's appeal, Manmat was restored to life. Now, this is the particular story in Rudreshwar Samhita of Parvati Khand of Shiva Puran. Interestingly, the Sthala Puran attaches Yama to this myth. And it says that Yama was present at that time and Yama felt it very touching. He felt overwhelmed that his master had actually to take this particular horrible task of killing somebody. So thereafter, there was a compromise between Lord Shiva and Manmatha, uh, sorry, and Yama. And he said, I will send my dutas and then later on, I will deal with the dead souls. So you will find that it was earlier the Shiva and Manmatha myth. Then you have Yama attached to this myth. Okay. Then we come to Sri Vanchyam. I told you about that uh, particular uh, English department expert who took me to this period, uh, this temple. And this is a shrine. Actually, inside photography, I could not do because it was raining at that time also. And uh, uh, without permission, we could not even take, uh, actually. So this is considered to be of later Chola period. That is 11th, 12th century CE. Even the earlier temple, which I showed, it is of Rajendra Chola, Rajaraj Chola and all that period, more or less, uh, you know, it uh, coincides with that. So it is quite possible that the Yama myth is attached to the Shiva temple sometime in the later Chola period. Now here we have got the shrine of Yama Dharmaraja and Chitragupta Maharaj. Yama and Chitragupta, they are there in Garuda Purana chapter 14. As if they are working together. How they are working together, it is very interesting. Now here the iconography which the uh, you know, the sculpture that I saw, Yama was seated on a pedestal facing south. Chitragupta was seated near his feet with an extended manuscript in hand. Why was this manuscript in hand? This was actually the record of the souls when they were on the earth, their deeds, misdeeds and all that. So Chitragupta is supposed to read out to the uh, death god that is Yama, the deeds of the newly departed souls. And accordingly, Yama is said to give the souls uh, further treatment. Interestingly, you will find that as we enter this particular temple, on the left-hand side, there is this shrine. So the devotees first enter here. It is called the shrine of Yama Dharmaraja. Always Yama is called Dharmaraja because actually he is doing his dharma. He is not against anybody. So actually one can say that he is giving justice. So he is also the god of justice, one can say. So he is impartial. And that is why he is doing his dharma impartially. So devotees pray here first and then myths there are myths showing association of Yama <coughs> with Shiva. There are local narratives. One narrative says that Lord Shiva uh, was often having the shrines. I mean the uh, temple of Lord Shiva were often uh, having the shrines of uh, either Ganesh or Kartikeya. So Yama was very uh, disturbed with this, agitated and once he said though I have been praying for such a long time for so many years, centuries there is absolutely no shrine so 
uh, the, how will people respect me? Okay, they will despise me because I'm associated with the death. And that is why it is said, the local narrative says that Lord Shiva put him here. <clears throat> and he said that those who uh, worship you will get a peaceful death. So that is how Yama came to be seated here. That is one narrative. And the second narrative says that it was here for the first time that Yama did penance to have uh, the, you know, uh, some kind of attention of Lord Shiva. A more interesting uh, part is that inside as we go, there is one Yama's wooden effigy which is on a ratha, wooden ratha. And uh, in one tithi in Tamil calendar called Masi Magam, that is in the Hindu month of Magha, there is the procession. Yama's wooden effigy and ratha carries the shivalinga which is very much inside. So on this day, Yama is said to be taking the burden of Lord Shiva. So the actual sculptures remain there and door only, but Yama's wooden effigy is first worshipped and then symbolically he carries Lord Shiva in the entire village. And the villagers are present there to welcome and take Ashirvad of Yama. So one can say that though Yama is said to be uh, the death god, there is some kind of awful aura around him. And that is, at least I could see that only in Tamil Nadu. In Maharashtra, Yama is mentioned as a Dikpal in the temple, but not as a god. Uh, we come to other uh, aspects and uh, I will try to uh, take them hurriedly. As we all know, there are myths about the solar and lunar eclipses. It is said that uh, the last solar eclipse of this year would be sometime on 3rd December or some, something. And uh, we know about uh, the do's and don'ts from Kalnirana. And these do's and don'ts have come from Puranas and from the medieval texts like Dharma Sindhu and Niranai Sindhu. A lunar eclipse a myth is there also in Inca civilization. And this is the particular interesting picture that I got. There is a belief that a jaguar once attacked the sun and the moon, sun or moon, whatever. And every time he attacks. So the solution is to beat the dogs. When the dogs bark, they will create a frightening sound and that's how the jaguar would run away. In Hindu mythology, we have got Rahu and Ketu. There are myths about diseases and there is also ancestor worship. Uh, you see, when I was doing research on the tasks, the religious uh, tokens for a project of the British Museum London, uh, I could come across some tasks from the Kolhapur region, Gujri region, which is around uh, Kolhapur Ambabai uh, temple. And then there were other uh, people who also, uh, you see, gave me the tax. Uh, there is divine significance of the tax of palms and leaves. It is said that these are donated, especially if there is some disease. And there is one particular reference. I mean, I'm coming to the next slide as such. Why they were given. Uh, sometimes you will find that when uh, some communities believe that when a child is extremely cranky, uh, uh, can't have any kind of solution after the medicines and all also, maybe earlier, in earlier generation, one Purusha or Stri was somewhat uh, angry with them and that is how 
you have got the particular symbol of ancestor worship here is the three tap and in fact when i was trying to look at you know uh, from where this particular tradition must have started the myths connected with the danas and all especially with regards to the diseases and i was uh, preparing uh, a speech for kokaniti has parishad as uh, the keynote speaker and then i came to know very interesting uh, references uh, see we all have gone i'm sure to mount mary outside mount mary church there are uh, these uh, you know human uh, body uh, say a uh, parts made in wax and they are offered to mount mary so this particular tradition according to jg fraser it started in medieval europe under christianity and he says that there is reference of molding of wax images of ailing members possibly from here this uh, concept came or uh, to the portuguese and then that is how mount mary church because that is very old actually even pre british and more interesting uh, references are found in peshwa daftar records that this was adopted by the peshwas as well but not the wax images they used to make the image of gold see the tacks of gold and all that the tacks which i showed just now so there is a mention of two tokens of gold shaped as eyes given as gifts as sadashiv rao bhau was suffering from smallpox this is in the document of 11th october peshwa dapt the document of dated 11th october 1741 and then there is a mention of offering of two gold images of deities as young madhav rao and vishwas rao were suffering from smallpox this is a document in 1749 and uh, interestingly are uh, enthoven records that there were silver eye tokens donated in case the cattle of a particular family was having having a disease and this was a practice in kolhapur and uh, now i come to on uh, say near i come to near history actually there is a mythical narrative about mahalakshmi temple here which i want to just give in short on in 18th century when governor lord william hornby was there he decided actually on a very grand project of reclamation of the area look at this particular arrow this is varli this is the old map of bombay as seven islands there is one island varli and this is the bombay island but there is a hill there okay and this particular portion it was to be reclaimed so that there would be a kind of free road from varli as you have the varli road uh, one can imagine uh, seeing that road from nehru planetarium through haji halli to mahalakshmi but then it is said that there were many attempts made but there was a failure to reclaim the area because often the sea waves would come and destroy what was built work was assigned to one ramji shivji a prabhu contractor now it is said that once mahalakshmi goddess came to his dream and she she asked him to rescue her and two sisters her two sisters from varli creek they were hidden actually in varli creek and she said if you promise me that a temple would be built of we three sisters on this hill up then we will not have that you have any a uh, kind of disturbance so he appealed to the british government mind you this is recorded also in gazetteers of bombay city and island 
ऑफ कोर्स दिस इज रेकॉर्डेड बाय मुंबईचे वर्णन ऑल्सो गोविंद नारायण माडगावकर बट माडगावकर सेज आमच्या लोकांना अशा काहीतरी कथा करण्याचा नाद आहे सो ही लिव्ह दॅट दॅट वे बट सी अ मिथ कॅन बी अ शॅडो इट इज क्वाईट पॉसिबल दॅट अर्ली सेटलर्स ओरिजिनल सेटलर्स ऑफ बॉम्बे लाईक कोळीज अँड आग्रीज दे मस्ट बी वर्शिपिंग महालक्ष्मी बट आफ्टर द मुस्लिम हॅड ऑक्युपाईड दिस पर्टिक्युलर प्लेस दीज पीपल दे मस्ट हॅव hidden these goddesses these images somewhere in the creek in some rock or something like now when we went there as heritage committee members we could see that there are two different kinds of pujas even today they are done there are the purohits of the original settlers also who perform puja and the brahmins also who perform puja so one can say that this particular myth you see even though it is generated it shows that this was the goddess of the kolis and agris earlier and then later on when other high caste people started coming and settling in bombay like prabhus brahmins then you will find that it came to be by them so this is the mahalakshmi temple and then this this particular slide now then i come to uh, another very interesting kind of uh, you see mythical narrative which was supposed to be there only short lived what happened was that the british constructed these two statues this is the original location and this is the uh, original location given by my uh, friend of heritage review committee harshad bhatia and these statues were of lord cornwallis and lord wellesley uh, built in 1812 and 1814 respectively cheating hr cheating hr should be saying is this your boss or is this hello hello yeah so um, you will find that uh, madgaukar also says govind nadar madgaukar and then later on you have got acharya and shingle mumbai cha vrittant they say that people used to flock here because they thought that these are the gods actually you will find this this particular statue has got some of the divine nims associated with the statue also very elaborate kind of articulate carving that was done the skull, sculpture and the statues were brought from england okay so they had lot of decorative and uh, administrative value also one can say but the people there the hindustani people that is the bombay people citizens native native citizens they used to go and worship them calling them vilayati dev this was dev for them but a vilayati dev foreign dev foreign god so the british uh, administrators when they came to know then they deputed police to shoo these people away because they used to make lot of mess there by offering a uh, coconut they used to break coconut here the coconut water used to sprinkle there the lot of garlands and flowers used to make it messy entire thing would have you know insects there and all that so you will find that this particular myth myth was just short lived myth and after some police fear then it was put to rest so i am just ending my uh, talk but before that i thought if definitely this is recorded if this is uh, to be used for students uh, this bibliography uh, bibliography also uh, books also will be useful so uh, ali geography of puranas this is uh, i found very important work because on uh, for uh, history researchers puranic records would be just the literary records but then the authenticity of that should be understood i mentioned already sukumari bhattacharya ji and uh, indian theology uh, theogony a comparative study of indian mythology from vedas to puranas fanan brothers book i have already referred to chelan's book i uh, gave a uh, reference yama dharma varshit in tamil nadu it is in tamil and then uh, this myth and history and history in myth this is a very interesting dialogue uh, collection of articles 
which uh, can have uh, some uh, you know spotlight on as to how the myths could be reconstructed into history then uh, dr arend dandikar's book i have already used uh, dr sadashivam badas gange here i have just given volume 2 but then the respective volumes are also there and then um, other books also i have referred to hazra's book again is uh, quite interesting studies in puranic records and all that and suvira jaiswal's book uh, help me in understanding the growth of vaishnavism starting from uh, the uh, shunga period even before that but for the shunga story construct heliodorus and to understand the analogy of kham baba with heliodorus and then uh, this was one of uh, my papers on mythology as such this is just select bibliography and <clears throat> with a big thank you i end my session i'll be very very happy if there are any questions thank you again participants can ask their questions if you have any question you can uh, put your question in the chat box please i'll be really happy if anybody comes with the remark also i think uh, dr geeta pense has raised um, her hand yeah so uh, dr geeta pense you can uh, write your question in the chat box or can she ask is it possible no no because okay. we have already muted all the participants okay okay fine fine no oh, but the lecture was very interesting and uh, we can we can uh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> and we can understand the painstaking efforts which uh, madam has taken for for such a Uh, such a lecture and i would say it is a, a very great uh, ad ad adaranjali to late professor s a dange so we are extremely grateful for the lecture thank you madam so thank you thank you i'm i'm beginning on so some front like actually the idea of kham baba which can be further developed yes. so your ideas came in my mind yeah, yes and uh, so your ideas came in my mind while so why are hair used so uh, or yeah or exactly or... exactly i don't know i mean you know that is just uh -huh. something uh, the, the women problems the gynecological yeah. problems associated with that uh, yeah that yeah so, maybe so you know in something... mythology class mythology yeah. class you may uh, uh, develop that i think and i'll be really very happy to know when you develop <laughs> and uh, let me have uh, that knowledge yeah yeah so uh, now i request uh, ajay pense to propose a vote of thanks the so what about now geeta pense madam mishi uh, wanting to ask she has, anything? Uh, she, she has not she written has anything in the chat box and by this way because yeah. her hand has been yes. since a long time yeah that's what hello on behalf of department of sanskrit and sanskrit university of mumbai and rutayan i extend a really hearty vote of thanks to you madam today we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts on situating mythical narratives in socio cultural history your thought uh, your scholarly views are really thought provoking for us i also thank all dignitaries students staff of the sanskrit department and computer section tomorrow we will meet at 3:30 again to listen the views of dr varsha shirgaonkar madam on topic cultural history of medieval maharashtra thank you thank you madam okay
नरसाय मैडम नरसाय मैडम हाँ तुम्हारे बंद करावी लगे हाँ एंड करावी लगे हाँ, हाँ, एंड करते 